We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us here today for this exciting event. Um, we are here to talk about the World Development Report, Migrants, Refugees, and Societies. Um, we're really grateful to co-host this series of panels with Refugees International, and I also want to highlight the work that CGD has done with Refugees um, International on refugee labor market access. Um, so one thing that's very exciting about today is that we are hosting the first public presentation of the report. I, of course, recommend it to everyone. It's 300 pages long, so um, you know it, it'll take some time. Uh, but, but we're really um, grateful in part because uh, many of you may be aware that CGD, through the leadership of Michael Clemens, um, who was here for almost 20 years, has been promoting migration as a critical driver of development for a long time. And so to see now um, the World Bank and so many others highlighting this issue is wonderful. Um, I will say something that may seem a little petty. We were excited to see that Michael was cited 63 times in the report. But you know that uh, CGD cares about outcomes, not outputs. So the real test, of course, will be the degree to which policymakers, uh, practitioners, nonprofits, employers, um, and businesses take up many of the critical ideas shared here. Um, so one of the things I want to highlight, and I'm sure that um, Chellar will speak about this, is the analytical framework that's presented in this report to really move us away from a dichotomy around forced migration and economic opportunity and voluntary migration and to really look at both the motives of people, something we know in our day-to-day -day lives, that people move for a mix of reasons and they're in very, again, complex circumstances. So to really look at that as a spectrum as well as the match to destination economies. Um, so we're really excited to hear more about that. Um, let me say here a few housekeeping items, which is that you can submit questions via email at events at cgdev.org and via Twitter, our handle at cgdev and our hashtag cgdtalks. Tomorrow's panel also has a very exciting lineup and it will focus more on the refugee issues highlighted in the report and that will be tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, so without further ado, um, I'm excited to introduce Chalar Uzdin, who was co-director um, of the 2023 World Development Report. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you all for coming, and especially thank you uh, to the Center for Global Development for hosting this event. As Cindy said, this is the first public outing. So if, if there are, if we are rough around the edges, I apologize in advance. Uh, uh, now, uh, WDR. It's, uh, for, I'm sure everybody knows what the WDR is. It's the annual flagship of the World Bank. Uh, it's done on a different topic. And uh, senior management, the chief economist, and the president decide on the topic. And uh, they put together a team uh, from the different units in the bank. Now, before I go, uh, I'm going to present, but this is the, the outcome of a large team. Uh, my co-directors, uh, Xavier De Victor, and then our task manager, Joyce, are going to join us in a little bit. They, they are delayed because of a meeting. So just wanted to let you know. 
Uh, now, the most impressive thing about the WDR, when you go to it, is not, it's 300, over 300 pages, but around 150 of it are references. Right? The actual text is only 200 pages. Please keep that in mind. Uh, and the references are there because the, it, the way we see it, it's like putting a puzzle together. You're taking all this knowledge and putting it together and presenting in a uh, unified framework to tell not just the story, but where do we go from there. That framework based on analytical and solid research, but to guide the policymakers. And those policymakers are both internal inside the bank as well as external, right? given uh, across the countries and civil society and so on and so forth. In this context, the, of the 350 pages, to me the most impressive part are actually the acknowledgement section. If you look at it, it's, it goes on pages and pages and pages. Uh, there are hundreds of names listed and we probably are missing another couple hundred. Uh, people who directly worked inside the, from the team, around 50 to 70 people, really tested the limits of my minimal managerial abilities. Fortunately, my co-directors are much better at it than I am. Uh, but also, everybody we consulted, the management in the bank, our colleagues, the executive directors, the civil society, we had a, uh, let me show you actually there. There we go. Right? This is the, the core team, the people who actually uh, put the pen to paper, and so you blame them. Uh, we had an academic advisory panel. We have a high-level advisory panel. So it was a very, very intense process. And the result is supposed to be this thinking framework. It's not about a specific country. It's not about a specific event. It is not about uh, specific things. It's not about Ukraine. It's not about what's happening in Sudan. But it is about how to change our thinking and how to move forward so that we lead to better development outcomes. Now, it's a short presentation. This is another thing I learned uh, from WDR. You read literally hundreds of papers at the minimum. You distill it to 200 pages. Then they ask you to write an overview, 30 pages. Then there's a press release, two pages. Right? It's going, then there's a tweet, all that stuff. You're trying to distill at some point, it becomes very difficult. But I'm going to try my best. So we're somewhere in between of a 20-minute presentation. Now. The things I'm going to emphasize are the, the key things so to give you a taste, to increase your appetite, so you go online and uh, lift it up. A couple important points we're making. Now, a lot of you have worked on migration, no details. Uh, the, if I'm not mentioning it, that doesn't mean it is not important or it is not there. Right? The, it's just we want to highlight the really new things that kind of surprised us and we want to change our thing on migration. One is, we define migrants as people who are not citizens of the country in which they live in. A lot of the migration data, some of the data sets I have constructed in the past, use the foreign born definition, not the citizenship definition. Number one reason is pragmatism, because that's how the data are collected. Uh, but the real one in development matters is the citizenship, because it's the rights you have determine your impacts, both at the destination, the impacts on you, and the impacts on, on origin. This is not an easy task. A lot of countries don't collect this data. We tried our best, so we come up, you know, there are around 270 million people who are uh, foreign born, uh, but around 184 million, more or less, plus or minus, who are not citizens. Of those numbers, around 40% are in high income OECD countries. 17% are in the Gulf countries, and 43% are in the, the, the low and middle income countries. Around 20% are refugees. A uh, big chunk of the, the people in the low and middle income countries are refugees, uh, less so in high income. And the important thing, you go to the report and we talk about at the country level, I want you to realize, emphasize, almost half the foreign born in high income countries are naturalized citizens. And this is a flow thing, right? So remember, of the non-citizens in a high-income country like the U.S., a big chunk of them are eventually going to become citizens. It's just they haven't been here long enough. So keep that in mind. Now, uh, there's another thing everybody assumes, oh, there's, this is an origin country, there's a this is a destination country. One of the main messages of the WDR, this is no longer the case in many countries. They are actually becoming both origin and destination. 
Uh, this is the case with the UK, this is the case with Nigeria, this is the case. I know you told us to turn off the phones and I apologize and I forgot because I'm single parenting this week, so. All right, all right, right? So this is, and this is based on the demographic patterns. And now, uh, what are the sources of uh, migration? We all know economic differences, poverty, so on and so forth. It's all over. The, we, uh, we can aggregate it in terms of the, the, the welfare gaps. Okay. Now, the, the second thing is demography. Look at the top line. That's Italy. Uh, when we launched the, the WDR uh, yesterday, uh, two days ago, the, the main Italian uh, newspaper had a highlight saying the World Bank says uh, Italy is getting everything wrong. It gave Italy as an example of the rapid demographic transition. But the ho whole world knows it, right? I mean, the aging in high-income countries, uh, starting with Japan and Korea. Uh, I think the number is by 2050, almost one out of every six people in, in Korea is going to be above the age 80. Right? How are you going to manage the, the, the social and the economic implications of this? It's not straightforward. Italy is expected to, the population is expected to decline by 50% by 2100. This is the first time in human history, first time, there are multiple first times we emphasize in this report, the first time in human history we're going to, sorry? Okay, ah, I thought you were going to oppose what I was going to say. I said, I swear it's true. <laughs> Uh, uh, the first time in human history that we are going to we are seeing peaceful voluntary population decline we have seen it because of wars natural disasters famines uh, diseases but this is the same, same first time it's happening voluntarily what people do not know though everybody knows what's happening in Italy Japan Korea uh, even the US what people do not know is what's happening in middle-income countries. This is the, the middle group figure is from Mexico. That the fertility decline in middle-income countries has been unprecedented and extremely rapid. It's not just Mexico, it's India, it's Turkey, it's uh, Bangladesh, it's Tunisia. They are all below replacement rate. The fertility decline in India from 60 to 2 happened in a matter of five decades. It took the US and Western Europe over 200 years. All these countries are becoming old before they become rich, as opposed to OECD countries. That has important implications for their economies, as well as global migration patterns, because these are the countries that are sending the migrants. If you look at the top migrant sending countries, it's India, Mexico, Bangladesh, Turkey, and if you look at it in terms of ratios, it's again the middle income because they are at the, you know, geographically close to the high income countries or they, people move between them, right? That's fundamental. And they also have the education and the skill creation mechanisms that match the needs of the destinations, which I'm gonna talk much closer, right? But these countries are now becoming destinations and that global competition for, for migrants is gonna change the patterns we know as of today. So going the, for the next three decades, everything we know about the migration patterns are gonna change. Now, on the other hand, you have the lower income countries. High fertility rates, right? And rapidly declining infant mortality and overall mortality rates. So we have the standard uh, aging pyramids, right? And that, is continue going to continue to grow. But the challenge for these countries is creating the jobs for their citizens, especially the young population. And that is obviously linked to all these other challenges we know, right? Keep that in mind. Now, the second thing that is unprecedented in human history is global warming and climate change. As opposed to demography, there's a big distinction between climate change and demography because, you know, I quote 2050. Pretty much, I'm hoping all of us will be around in 2050. The people who are going to be employed and will be around are still are already born. So we have a very good idea what the population dynamics of the world is going to be. Global warming is slightly different. We know the science of global warming. We know where it's setting. We know the implications. But we do not know how it interacts with global mobility. 
So there are significant unknowns in that respect. So far, the evidence, when we do, we look backwards, a lot of the mobility has been internal and associated with urbanization, so on and so forth, because climate impacts your livelihood, right? And it operates through the labor market, so on and so forth. But the existing pressures are going to increase, and we do not know how it's going to split into domestic movements and cross-border movements. We do not know where the capacity of the domestic movements to be able to absorb the shocks due to climate change. Right? So those are the two big things. There's a lot more in the report, but these are the ones I want to highlight now. What does this, all these motivations and everything imply? Now, I've been working on, on migration for a while. Today, our, we're going to be talking more about, and our discussions are going to be focusing more on the labor market impacts. And the labor market perspective on migration is pretty straightforward. I mean, us economists are pretty uh, predictable in that respect, right? So the idea is, if a migrant comes from country A to country B, right, the, what you're looking for is the match. And the match, I'm not just talking about the skills. Skills is the, probably the biggest component, right? Do you possess the skills that are in demand in the destination country? It can be the two, this is my favorite example, and I'm sure some of you heard it before, the two occupations in the United States with the highest ratio of immigrants are engineering professors and fruit pickers, because those are the skills in need, in demand in the United States, right? So you possess those skills, the bigger the match, and also there's the, the, the costs of migration. We are acknowledging the costs. A lot of labor economists, unfortunately, only looking at the labor market impact, but for example, the consumption of public services, right? Integration costs. Those are important. Some of them, some people are not a good match. They're a weaker match. The one thing we are emphasizing in the report, and this is fundamental, one of the things I hope you get out of this, my, all this talk, is the policies of the destination countries in terms of the rights granted to the migrants, especially in terms of legal presence, determine where you are so that your position in that line, in that vertical axis, on the y-axis, is endogenous. I know it's a big word, and uh, our ECR colleagues, EXT colleagues, don't want us to use technical terms, but it is. it depends on the policy, right? So it is the destination countries can impact uh, where, where you are in terms of your contribution. So that's the economist perspective. Right? And that line is, is, is movable, depending on policy. Policy can move it, place you where you are. Now, the second perspective is international law, especially the human rights law. Countries have signed multiple agreements, starting with the end. Actually, a lot of it started after the First World War, uh, but formalized globally after the Second World War about, you know, what does it mean to be a refugee and what are the obligations of the the host countries. And the agreement is you satisfy certain criteria, you are, you are legally uh, eligible for asylum, and the destination country, regardless, has to take you in. And they cannot send you back. Right? So that's where the motivation is. That's the, our x-axis in this figure. My motivation coming to the United States it wasn't because of my safety or fear for my life, but it was for economic and professional reasons. So I'm much more on the left-hand side. The Syrians, the Venezuelans, the Ukrainians, and multitudes of other people are on the other extreme. They are eligible for asylum. And where you are determines the obligations of the host country. Now, our contribution is to take the economics approach and the, the, the rights approach, the international law, and said in a very creative way, put them together, right? And the reason why we are doing this is to emphasize the following. A lot of, especially academics, again, uh, many people are guilty of it, they look at only one group and they do not look at, or the policymakers, the overall picture. The point the WDR is making, no two migrants are identical. 
As a result, their impacts are, ident are not identical. As a result, the policy needs are not identical. And that's where this figure gets, all right? So when you overlay these two, two dimensions, you get four quadrants. Uh, vast majority of the migrants in the world fall into that top left quadrant. Economic migrants who move for personal reasons, economic reasons, professional reasons, they are a good match. Even the undocumented ones, right? There's a huge need for undocumented migration in services sectors in the United States. The latest inflation numbers are pointing out the issue of the services sector. That's where the, 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 the migrants are. And they are not coming for protection needs. They are there, vast majority, okay? What do you need to do there? I'll talk in a little bit. Uh, and then there are also refugees who actually can generate positive impact. Right? I mean, Albert Einstein is, is the best example, but think of all the Venezuelan doctors and the Syrian doctors or nurses, or even with minimal training where people can enter the labor market, or just, you have to just give them the access. That's all it takes, right? Say, you're allowed to move to where the jobs are and you're allowed to work given your qualifications, right? The policy there is very, very simple. What can we do to maximize the gain? So to push the people as high as possible via policy, right? Now, the second big group are the refugees. Now, a large number of refugees are women, elderly, who have never worked, or children. So their labor market contributions are minimal. But they have the needs, they have the protection needs, so they have to be taken in and be, be, be provided for. But it creates tremendous costs, especially for the hosting communities. The question is, how do we manage those costs? Because we have international obligations. We have signed agreements that we're gonna honor these obligations. Now the fourth group is another innovation or the contribution of the WDR, is identifying what we call distressed migrants. These are the people on the bottom left-hand corner. Right? These are the people on the boats in the Mediterranean. These are the people on the southern border of the United States. These are the people who are migrating because of economic desperation, but they do not legally qualify for asylum. But given the skills and given the limited opportunities they have in terms of legal rights, they are not a good match. They are a weaker match for the destination country. So what happens? Either they claim asylum because that's one way of entering, which leads to now it becomes a targeting problem from the destination country perspective. It takes two, three years to process asylum because then you're trying to figure out who really qualifies and who doesn't. Or they try to enter undocumented, which leads to this whole sense of loss of control at the border. So the presence of the distressed migration actually threatens the stability of the legal entry channels for both economic migrants and for the refugees, endangering the whole system. What do we need to do? And that's one of the biggest challenges in terms of migration policy. It is all based on the underlying main fundamental motivation of distress migration is the lack of economic opportunities for a lot of these people. So it's a long-term program that you need to find solutions for development and poverty. Now, let me go just quickly the policy suggestions because that's actually what matters. That's the objective of the WDR when we're talking to our internal colleagues who are on the ground doing projects or we're talking to other policymakers and CSOs. The easiest ones are the top groups. These are the economic migrants where the, the match is strong. Uh, what you have to do is how can we make it even stronger? It starts with rights. Uh, the WDR puts a lot of emphasis and responsibility also on the origin countries. Many origin countries are, uh, for lack of better word, is not proactive in this regard, right? They're just watching, their people are leaving, they send remittances and it's fantastic, great. But there are so many things these countries can do to increase the development impact of migration, whether if it's consular protection, lowering the remittance and migration costs, but more importantly, improving the education systems in origin countries so you're preparing your citizens better in terms of human capital for the global labor market as well as for the domestic labor market. Destination countries, what do you need to do? You have to 
you have to, I mean, this, I cannot emphasize this enough. There, are, there is demand. I showed you the demographics. The data are out there. You have to figure out legal entry channels to address the needs of the migrants. And you have to figure out integration mechanisms. Because integration also leads to better selection, who comes. And also, once the migrants come, what they invest in terms of their human capital and social capital. So this, is a, this becomes a circular process reinforcing each other. Right? Now, refugees. That's a challenge. But it is our global challenge. It's our joint challenge because we signed agreements for it. Right? Given the nature of the, the refugee crisis, unpredictability and location, vast majority of the refugees are in neighboring countries, most of them with limited resources and if at this, and the bordering communities. How do we reduce it? Another big problem with the refugee policies and problems is that our approach has been, oh, it's temporary, let's do kind of a, I don't want to use the word ad hoc, but short-term tools because of maybe political reasons for whatever. But one of the numbers we come up with, average refugee status lasts 13 years, whereas the budgets are on an annual basis. You cannot make efficient policy in this environment. What do you need to do? You need to have long-term or at least medium-term financing mechanisms, which are shared much more equally globally. Maybe you're a country where you don't have refugees, but you have an international global obligation for that. The second, the host communities, host countries, this has been the case, uh, what Colombia did with the Venezuelans, what has been happening with the Ukrainians in Europe, what the, uh, the Turkish government did with the Syrians. You have to let them move. You cannot keep them at camps at the border communities because then the burden is bigger and you're actually destroying the dignity of the refugees themselves. You have to give them opportunities. You have to integrate them into the domestic health and education systems. Okay? Now, and finally, distressed migration. That is the biggest challenge. Two good things. One is their numbers are small, right? Although they are in the news all the time uh, because it's, it's there, right? It's, it's right in front of us uh, because of the, 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 the challenges, the, the human challenges they face, the, the thousands of people who die at sea uh, or the policies, some of the harsh policies destination countries implement to prevent these inflows. So what needs to be done? Number one is some of these people are literally definitely leaving because of their legitimate fear for their lives. We have to expand coverage. So they, they need to be covered by asylum laws, right? Depends, uh, I'm not a legal expert. We don't, you know, we only have 200 pages. So we're not getting into details. This is a, something that needs to be done. But those people need to be acknowledged and granted asylum. A lot of other people in the other group, they are coming because there is need in the destination labor markets. We have to figure out a way of extended legal entry channels to address it. It doesn't have to be permanent. It can be temporary. U.S. implemented it for a long time and until they canceled it, the Bracero program, for example, right? Those programs, we have to figure out ways so that people then jump over that line because of the rights they have, the formal entry channels increase. But the most fundamental, oh, and the, the final one is, these are all short term, relatively short term, medium term, the deportation policies, return policies, especially when we're talking about a lot of these are transit migrants, jointly uh, together with the transit countries, say Mexico's or Tunisia's or Turkey's of the world, right? The destination countries need to figure out basically deportation mechanisms that respect the dignity of the people that are not harsh, okay? But the, the way we're gonna reduce this at the end of the day is through economic development, and that takes longer term thinking. We need to reduce the demand or the motivation for distressed mobility. And this goes back to the demographics, and this goes back to education policies and human capital policies and overall development agenda. Because at the end of the day, Distressed migration is not a problem, it's a symptom, right? You cannot treat a symptom. You have to treat the underlying causes. But we have to acknowledge what the, 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 the symptom is. And we have to separate it from economic migration. All right, now, 
Finally, how do we do all of this? Mm -hmm. Right? I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm from the research department. I'm embarrassed to say from the bank. A lot of people say, "What do you know about real development?" So here are the 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 things. How do we make policy differently? Now, first thing is a lot of migration policy, as opposed to trade policy and all these other global policies unfortunately are done unilaterally. But that's extremely inefficient, we know it. We know it from trade policy, we know it from other areas. You need bilateral regional cooperation. There are many, many examples of these in the report, but we need to have a dialogue because we are seeing the destination countries need people. It's coming, it's, it, it's not coming, it's already here. Right? They need people who are a good match with a certain skill sets, with certain demographic or personal characteristics. You have to coordinate and work with the origin countries to meet those demands. Then, especially for the refugees, we need much better multilateral cooperation mechanisms. So one is basically we have to work together. That's number one. Financing is a big deal, especially when it comes to refugees. Right? You have to share the burden equally because that's what we signed up for. Uh, we have to have much more medium or long-term perspectives, not short-term immediate uh, crises. Right? I mean, the Syrians came to Turkey almost now a decade ago, and look at all the, the refugee crises in the world. Uh, and then finally, you have to give the voice to everybody who has something at stake. How the policy is made. The, some of the ideal cases, when you look at Singapore, Australia, and Canada, how, for example, they have the private sector, the employers, as part of the decision-making process. Right? It, what are the costs and benefits of changing different dimensions of policy? Give voice to the migrants. Give voice to the refugees. Everybody, you can imagine, who have something at stake. Unfortunately, in many countries, especially destination countries, policies are made with only a narrow set of group of people in, the, in their bureaucracies. So that has to change. Okay? And uh, the key messages. How are we doing with time? I know I talk too much and I lose track of time. Okay, right? So just to recap, remember our quadrants? That's our framework. Saying no two migrants are the same. You have to figure out where your challenges are if you're an origin or a destination country or a region and you implement right policies. These, these are just rough guidelines to figure out where, where the policy action has to be. For vast majority of the migrants, 184 million, remember, the match is strong. They are there because of the economic pull factors. There are costs. What we need to do is to maximize those gains. And then the migrants benefit, the destination definitely benefits, and the origin countries benefit. Okay. Uh, Bigger responsibility on origin countries uh, in terms of preparing their migrants, protecting their rights, helping them before, during, and after the migration episode. Helping the people after they come back. Reintegration into the labor markets, entrepreneurship, or even social protection, taking, their fam taking care of their families while they're abroad. Now, when the, the match is weak, when we're at the bottom quadrant, right? That's where the challenges arise. But the policies are different if you're talking about Refugees, where the responsibility is global and has to be shared much more fairly. Uh, or distressed migration, where we need to figure out to reduce the, 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 the number of those people with a multiple set of mechanisms, uh, policies I had mentioned. And then we have to do things differently. How we design, how we discuss, and how we implement policy. It has to be a global joint effort. Uh, so... I think that's it. I'm done. And this is the, where the report is. And then uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much.
Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone, and special thanks to Chalar. That was an excellent presentation, and I just kept thinking, you know, if, if I had, you know, if the one wish, I would say let's all implement policies that advance the really um, important ideas in the framework. Um, so now we have a chance to have a discussion, you know, of the ideas presented in the report and um, really have a conversation. And just so everyone knows, then we'll move to audience questions and we'll also hope to take some questions from online. So let me first start by introducing our panelists. Um, we're so delighted to have Tara Watson, who is a professor at Williams College and also the director of the Center on Children and Families at the Brookings Institution. Also, Danny Bahar, um, Associate Professor at Brown University and CGD non-resident fellow. Um, I've also had the opportunity to co-author a bit with Danny on inclusion of Venezuelans in Colombia, so hopefully we'll talk about that experience and uh, many others. Felipe Munoz, the Migration Unit Chief um, inter at the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, and also hope, hope it's okay that I mention also a former senior official of the Colombian government who worked on some of the policies that Chalar mentioned. So uh, first, I wanted to start with uh, just an overarching question in terms of what you think the impact of this report will be and what you hope it will be, um, starting with Felipe, especially you know, since we're here to talk, focus more on the um, economic migration parts of the report, um, but also not excluding the others. Um, Felipe, what, what do you think and what do you hope will come from this report, especially with, you know, migration as a driver of development? No, thank you very much for, for Center Global of Development for hosting this event. And it's a pleasure to be here with uh, Professor Watson and, and my, my friend Danny, and of course with Chalar and Xavier Antoine. Uh, I want to congratulate for the report. I think the, uh, the, the main message for, for the report that I, that I want just to highlight is this, that the migration is a driver for development. Of course, you still have a lot of problems and humanitarian problems for the migrants, for the refugees, but we need to change like the narrative about it. This is a driver for development, how we transform this, uh, as we call crisis, in a development opportunity is what we do in the Inter-American Development Bank. We're trying to help the governments in Latin American regions. Of course, I'm going to talk more about Latin America because this is the region. We help the governments to transform their policies just to create uh, the adequate legal frameworks. And I'm talking a little bit about my experience in the government of Colombia as an advisor of the president, first Santos and after Duque, how we can decide just to create a very ample legal framework to integrate the migrants into the society and it can create a, a very good model. And we want just to, to take these ideas and take the ideas from other countries. And I want just to highlight that maybe for Latin America, uh, we have a, a, a very specific characteristics. We have an intra-regional migration. Mm -hmm. We have a joint migration. And if, if it's intra-regional from the same region, uh, the people is very similar to the other. Then the integration is easier. It's a joint people, but also is a permanent migration trend. Because when we have the surveys, for example, for Venezuela and in so many of the Latin American countries, 70% uh, of them answered that they want to stay in the country of destiny for more than five years. Then if we have this, and we, have, uh, we are going to launch a report with the OECD uh, and a new MPD in, in a few weeks about uh, what, what, are, what are the governments doing in terms of inclusion of the migrants, I can say that uh, uh, we have found like a three main characteristics. The first is that the, the migrants have more rate of being employed, not in a formal employment, but have a job than the natives. The second characteristic is of course, and it's, it's obvious that they are in a more informality sector, but also that they are more overqualified than the natives. Then you have the people here, you have the opportunity in the countries of Latin America and of the region, then the second stage and the things that we do is not to create programs for migrants, is to create the right social policy to include the migrants as part of the solution as in the same level to the local population because you mentioned one of the key things to avoid xenophobic sentiments is that. Then I think this is a very good example how we did a full of examples all around the world how we can use in the Latin American migration, which is a more recent migration wave, 
in, 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 in the world and how we can help in and continue helping the governments to create the real legal framework and also to create the real good signals for the private sector because it's not the governments that are going to create the jobs to absorb these kind of things. It's the private sector. I think these two characteristics I want just to highlight as a first comments. Great. Thank you so much, Felipe. And I also want to highlight one other aspect of leadership in Latin America, which is the Cartagena Agreement, which, you know, as Chalar presented that, you know, in from 1951, post-World War II refugee framework, you know, it recognizes really specific categories um, for protection, but Cartagena also includes, for example, generalized violence, people who are fleeing gang violence, to offer them other protection as well. So that's another example and really want to highlight the leadership there. Um, now let me turn it over to Tara. Um, I agree that the, um, the report's focus on migration as a tool of development is critical. I come from a perspective where I mostly think about U.S. policy, immigration policy, and the whole conversation is about the politics of the U.S. system and uh, the border. And um, sometimes we lose sight of the big global benefits that come from migration, both for um, destination countries and for origin countries. And so I think it's great to highlight that. I also really like the matrix that was presented and thinking about match and match as being something that policy can influence. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that really resonated me, with me is this idea that um, legal status, rights, and protections of people who are entering, say, the US context or destination country really can shape how successful they will be economically and therefore um, you get the most bang for your buck in terms of mm -hmm. benefits from migration and um, some of those costs that come along with new migrants and the, the need to integrate them um, are, are mitigated when you know you have policies in place to support people. For me, that's mm -hmm. the rights, the legal status, and, and the opportunity to work. Great, thank you. Danny. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. My home away from home at CGV, so it's, 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 it's great. And, and um, you know, the, the, the first reaction is I'm really happy. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled that, that, um, that the World Bank, um, you know, is setting the agenda in, 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 this, in policy discussions to really put migration in the center of what development policy should be. Um, and and I, I, I'm, I really want to congratulate Jalar and his team. I think Jalar um, uh, has an has a incredible track record on, on, on thinking about this for many, many years. I met Jalar 10 years ago. We should celebrate our 10 years uh, for the <laughs> anniversary. Um, where he, you know, he, he, he leads this, sem this conference and bringing the scholars, young scholars, and, and uh, to think about migration mm -hmm. development. So it's, it's, it's a really labor of love that I want to appreciate um, on behalf of all of us. Um, and, and, and I agree. I mean, that's, that, th that's um, I, I hope that that's the key message, that we start thinking about, mi about migration as a tool, mm -hmm. not as a burden. And I think yeah. the intuition that I, uh, the, 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 my intuition thinking about this is that, you know, it turns out that uh, we've been thinking about development for a while. Um, and, and I am convinced, um, you know, based on, on everything I read, my, a little bit of my own research, that you know, migration is the unlikely key to the global to economic development. Is the key, is, is that tool that we have like for a, for a very long while um, underestimated? And, and the reason is that, you know, we, the, the, the typical tools that we thought were out there, um, they haven't really moved the needle that much, right? It wasn't macroeconomic stability, <laughs> right? Now you have very, a lot of countries who, who, who are developing, who have achieved to, uh, you know, have independent central banks, to be able to borrow, even in their own currency, um, in massive amounts. It wasn't really that much about building institutions it wasn't really that much about opening up to free trade and opening up to capital flows. Um, it wasn't, definitely wasn't about savings and capital accumulation, if, if there are some solo models, uh, people here um, pushing that. And, and the reason that it wasn't all that is that we know that 60% of what is, explains cross-country income differences is productivity. But we don't know what productivity is. We still don't know what productivity is. And productivity, but at the end, productivity has to do with doing more with the same resources. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with knowledge. And it has to do with know-how. It has to do with technologies. And it turns out that what I think, based on, on a lot of research, is, is a key aspect of moving technologies from place to place and moving know-how from place to place is moving brains. Mm -hmm. And the most effective way to, me, to move brains is through migration. So, so I think that that's... Um, you know, the key message that, that, that I hope is going to set, um, is going to change the conversation on migration and really have um, 
multilaterals and, and countries and governments and society to start really seeing migration as a tool, not as a burden. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And just to highlight a few things, which probably many people in the audience know that, you know, we, uh, Chalar mentioned remittances, you know, which now outpace foreign direct investment and official development assistance. So just, again, you know, proof point for how this can be a powerful tool. And that um, I already mentioned Michael Clements um, of CGD, and he published a paper 10 plus years ago, you know, trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk, which are like what, you know, there, there are these huge opportunities, and I don't at all want to diminish the um, p political challenges. You know, we've talked about the polarized discourse, but that shouldn't steer us away from really looking at the opportunity and facilitating it to the extent possible. Um, and so with that, I wanted to turn back. Well, first, let me see, Charlie, do you want to come back in and comment on anything the panelists have said? No, no, it, it's been fantastic. I, you know, first, although I'm sitting on the stage, as I said, it's a big team. Xavier and Joyce uh, just okay. arrived. Yeah. So they're going to answer the hard questions when I'm stuck. <laughs> Uh, but it is a large team, so uh, this is a lot of combined thinking and also our external advisory board as well, which are very grateful. Two things I want to emphasize. Number one, I mean, the one thing we want to emphasize, whether if you're an origin country, destination country, or a transit country, policies are complementary. So the effectiveness of one policy increases if you implement another policy. So you have to approach migration, immigration or immigration, as a package. You cannot do piecemeal. Mm -hmm. The countries, especially origin countries that are successful, look at it as an overall package and how it can be part of the overall development agenda. Mm -hmm. okay. Same thing from the destination country perspective. What can we do, these packages, so that we get the best, biggest, in a sense, bang for the buck mm -hmm. in terms of migration and how we increase the match of the, of the migrants, right? That, that's there. And that, whether if it is, by the way, migration creates uh, redistributive impacts. There are people, local people, who are impacted. I'll give you an extreme example. Ronaldo goes to Saudi Arabia getting paid $500 million. Yes, but there's one Saudi player now who's out of a job, right? <laughs> the, 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 I'm, I'm giving an ex extreme <laughs> example. But that, that displacement is there, and that creates, for example, political opposition to migration. So we have to implement mechanisms, social protection or labor mobility mechanisms, to basically reduce those costs so we mm -hmm. can have better migration. All of these has to be integrated. Mm -hmm. So at the end, that enables us to implement policies so the matches are improved. Yeah. Okay? And then we have to think of how we, remember the, the lower, uh, the re refugee corner, how we share the burdens and for the distressed migration, what policies we implement to reduce the number of distressed mobility. All of these policies are complementary. You have to look at it from that holistic perspective. Uh, and uh, I like Dani's phrase, looking at migration not as a burden. Mm -hmm. right? that, that's fundamental. Uh, the gains from migration, this is my personal observation, gains from my migration are more long-term Remittances are there in front of us because we focus on it because it's measurable and right there. But there are gains from, you know, knowledge transfers, mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, investment, all those things which are harder to quantify and they accrue in the long term. And they are less observable. Mm -hmm. They are less transparent. Whereas the burdens are much more short term and immediate in your face. Right? That also creates a political economy challenge that needs to be addressed via complementary policies. So I think whatever work we do and the engagement we have and all these talks hopefully will enable us to convince the, the policymakers that migration is an opportunity, not a burden. Excellent. Thank you. And I want to ask Danny later about the entrepreneurship um, connection as well. So, um, yeah, so Felipe, to you, we've talked a little bit about, yeah, how do we facilitate greater benefits? Um, and it'd be great if you could talk about what the IDB um, is doing in the space, both, you know, financing and non-financing tools and support. Yeah, the, the first thing is that we, 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 we work in three main categories helping the countries. First is identification of the migrants. Second is to promote regularization. And third is to promote a set of policies for inclusion. Why is important identification? Because we need to know who are the people who come and what are their qualifications. Because in that way, even you produce information which is useful for the private sector. 
for the private sector to identify what are the people that are there, what are their qualifications. And I, I mentioned before that at least in Latin America, and I think it's for uh, everywhere in the world, they are overqualified than the natives, or they are working in things that they, 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 they have more capacity. The regularization, which is of course, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit later about more about the identification and the data, because I think we need more like a film than as a picture, and we need to work more in census and in household surveys. Mm -hmm. The second set of, of work that we are doing with the governments is about regularizations. Uh, just imagine that in, in a recent report that we launched, we identified that there were in the, in the region more than 90 extraordinary regularization and legal processes, because it's not the same thing about refugees, the discussion in Latin America than in Europe or in the Asia, than what the governments of the region have done with this massive influx of migrants in the last five years is to create a special regularization process just to help the people to stay in the country. The most, complete, the most uh, uh, ample one, of course, is the Colombian one, which is a temporal protection status for 10 years. But at the same time, for example, Belize, who has 15% of their population are migrants, mainly from Guatemala, they are providing a very generous process of regularization of Ecuador, of Dominican Republic. Then what is happening in the region is that you have a set of regularization and we are behind helping the governments to produce that. And third is that the inclusion, because it's not enough to have a regularization process. You need to create another set of legal framework in two main categories. One, which is regulatory framework. You need to create uh, work permits to consider. There are some places in the region where you have, for example, maximum percentage of foreign people that you can hire in a company. Uh, also, you need to validate the diplomas, which is a very complicated thing, and you need to do it, especially from people that uh, that left from the country in a very, very forced migration and complicated situations. You need to create a program for a skill certification because there are so many jobs that need these skill certifications. And also you need to work with the agency employments at the local level. This is like a set of things that we have identified in a study that we are doing with Jose uh, Ignacio Hernandez from Harvard University and we are going to publish in the second semester in the 26 countries that we work in the bank, what are the main regulatory barriers? But there are another set, and just one minute, a non-regulatory barrier, which is the perception of the public opinion of the migrants, which plays a very important role when you are trying to include the migrants in the labor market, so in the economic sector. Then we recently launched a laboratory on public perception and migration, and we have found that uh, still in the region, more than half of, of, uh, of, of the people think that the migration can create unemployment and can create a problem for their own jobs. Then we need to work in that. We need to provide fact as an evidence. And we have launched another report with UNDP where we made an experiment in nine countries. And when you provide information, facts informa fact information, numbers and data, the people can change the perception. Mm -hmm. Then you need to work not only in the regulatory, but you also need to work in the, in the, in the perception. And we have the tools, the financial tools, with our, our resources, non-reversible resources that the Board of Directors had authorized for put resources into the loans that the governments asked to, to the bank in the social sector if they include migrants as part of the beneficiary. It's not programmed just for migrants because it creates xenophobic sentiments among the local population. It's just to include the migrants as part of the beneficiaries of the process. This is part of the tools yeah. that I think uh, tra can transform what the Shalar said about uh, a desire into a real policy uh, framework. Yeah, and I just want to underscore the importance um, combining what Shalar and you shared about you know recognizing that some people in a local population you know, may be displaced from their jobs, and at the same time, that can be amplified in a way that's creating a non-regulatory barrier to integration. And so how do we have the analysis to distinguish and really to, you know, to address the reality and create the win-wins. The and I also want to quickly note that the World Bank has also been a leader in providing that type of financing for both host communities and refugees um, through the IDO window for host uh, communities and refugees. And that's been really exciting to watch. And your work is very complimentary and building on the same evidence base. So now let me turn it to Tara and ask, you know, you mentioned that you focus more on the US angle. So 
what do you see as some of the opportunities and where you think policies can move to get to more of these win-wins? Yeah, thanks uh, for the question. I was thinking about what um, the idea of comprehensive integrated policies means in the U.S. context, <laughs> and um, we are definitely not there right yes. now. Congress has more or less not done any um, significant reform since 1990 um, mm -hmm. on immigration. and. Um, that, so, so, for example, the numbers, uh, the caps we have on the legal immigration system are, were determined in 1990, um, even though obviously our population has grown a lot since then and our labor market needs have changed dramatically. Um, we also have um, a lot of activity at the border. Um, it's sort of a, in a mix of these types along the bottom row. So it's people yeah. who are seeking asylum some people who are entering irregularly, I can never say that word, um, <laughs> without authorization, uh, surreptitiously, but many who are just presenting themselves, um, seeking asylum, but who may not fit the most narrow definition mm -hmm. of um, what we have a legal obligation to um, treat as an asylum case. Um, we have a lot of um, distress at the border coming from that. And because Congress doesn't act, we have this vacuum. The administration has to try to step in and do piecemeal things that are temporary and can be undone by a future administration, um, which leads to a lot of confusion, chaos, and um, uncertainty. Um, and so my big um, push is that Congress really needs to take this up. It's not um, from talking to people on the Hill. It doesn't sound like um, it's likely to happen um, in the near future. Um, but it's, it's essential, and it's, I, I view it as even more essential given the demographic um, facts that we heard earlier. Mm -hmm. We have a population that without immigration is um, flat or even declining in the mm -hmm. coming decades in the U.S., and our labor market um, needs and our general um, aging of the population really make it imperative that we have a um, growth, and that is going to come from immigrants one way or another. I would love to see it come and through a regularized process. Um, that allows those individuals to have more security when they're coming in and allows the U.S. to benefit most from uh, their contributions. Thank you. Can I just ask a follow-up, you know, kind of short of comprehensive immigration reform, you know, led by and passed by Congress. Do you see any bright spots where we could do better? Uh, many spots where we could do better. <laughs> One place that um, I think has been a little bit of a bright spot is the, the Biden administration's humanitarian parole program, um, which has been expanded a lot in the past uh, year. And um, the one way it's been, it's been effective is that it's taking migrants who otherwise would be coming through the southern border, either presenting for asylum or coming surreptitiously, and giving them another pathway, giving mm -hmm. them another opportunity. And I think it really demonstrates that when there are legal pathways, um, people will take advantage of them. And um, it's, a, it's a, a little bit of a ray of hope. It's a temporary program. It's under legal threat. Um, and it, once people are here, it's also temporary for them. So mm -hmm. it's definitely not the, um, the silver bullet to this. But um, we need to think about ways that we can expand the legal opportunities for people mm -hmm. who want to come here uh, and work. Great. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to mention that yeah, CGD has also worked on the H-2 programs, and you know there are some potentially additional opportunities for people to come through such legal pathways, especially to support the um, farm and agriculture-related economy. So um, we'll keep working on those bright spots. Okay, so Danny, a two-part question for you. One is, um, you know, I think we've talked a bit about the economic policies that lead to these you know, win-wins where possible. If you could say a little bit more about the social inclusion policies that you see as most important and the impact of a more forward-leaning social inclusion policies um, in countries of destination. And then secondly, I did want to loop back on the entrepreneurship point because you've done some really exciting research there um, on that and you know, technology and knowledge transfer. Yeah. Thank you. Let me start with the second. Let me give okay. you a, a yes. five-part answer. Okay. Two part. <laughs> um, no, I, I want to start with the, with, with the latter one because I think that, uh, Jalar, when you were talking a lot about this quadrant in particular that probably presents the biggest challenges, mm -hmm. which were the people who, who probably had the, 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 the most difficult match and also the, the forced um, aspect of their migration, um, I can see there uh, some opportunities when it comes to policy. 
and I want to maybe even put some provocative ideas here okay. on the table. And, and, but, but, and it links exactly to what you were saying that there's no one thing, I mean, no policies come together if you really want to maximize the tools. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, you know, part of the challenge of development in many cases is, is some sort of coordination failure, right? Yeah. Is that um, countries are unable to expand their economy uh, sometimes because they don't have the skills that allows you to expand into maybe other sectors. Uh, but at the same time, the sectors don't flourish because there's no skills and the skills don't come because there's no sectors, right? So we have this very difficult coordination failure, which I think in particular, uh, migration can play a huge role. And I think it, it goes straight into the match issue. And, and, and here, um, you know, Felipe and I have actually been working on, on some of those ideas. For instance, by looking at the match uh, as a case study of, of um, and this was a study that, that Felipe um, uh, ambitioned and, and that I was able to participate on, on thinking about uh, what is what is the possible contribution, for instance, of refugees or, or, or Guatemalan refugees mm -hmm. going into Mexico. You know, Mexico is, a, is an interesting case where where the country has developed in this kind of dual um, uh, way in which the North has really benefited a lot from the trade agreements, but the mm -hmm. South less so. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge disparity within the country, but the South has a lot of, uh, is seeing a lot of people transiting, um, coming from Central America, mm -hmm. Guatemala, and, 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 and the Northern Triangle, through the United States, some of them stay in Mexico. But we ask the question like, what, what are the skills that, this, that, that these immigrants are bringing, are offering, that could be demanded by possible industries in the South? Not industries that already exist, but industries mm -hmm. that could exist, given those skills. So I think a lot. Of, I think that there's a lot of opportunities there, um, uh, you know, in, in a case by case basis on looking, not only the things that are already there, but the things that could emerge. Yeah. With um, I'm going to say the bad word with some industrial policy, um, that could also be a complementary policy to, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, mm -hmm. as a way to maximize the gains from, from from migration. And I think that there's a lot of opportunities there to see the match as something that is more dynamic. Um, and something that can definitely is not a one or zero, but can mm -hmm. can really expand with some policies. Um, and and I think that here also comes a part of, of not only about the labor markets, but other opportunities for migrants, yeah. such as entrepreneurship. Yeah. And I think that that um, particularly for this population, that are um, you know that, that 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 uncertainty is something that really uh, surrounds them, unfortunately, because they don't know if they can stay, they don't know if, you know where they're gonna end up in many cases. Um, it, 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 it really poses a big challenge because we do know as a fact, a stylish fact, that migrants are, are, are very much entrepreneurial people because mm -hmm. the act of migrating is, a, is an act of risk taking. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that these are, this is another set of, of, of complementary policies that could also um, you, you know, make a dent on, on everything that has to do with dynamism in the economy. And, and I think the, the, the case that you're probably referring to is, is the study we did on, Colum on Venezuelan refugees in Colombia. You know, for the past three, four years, I think my academic career has been to do a program evaluation of everything that Felipe did in his time <laughs> in government. <laughs> uh, so what is Felipe doing? Let me just evaluate that. <laughs> and it's been kind of good. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so, so we started the Fed, we started this program where, where the Colombian government provided um, a, 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 a massive, uh, uh, regularization, I know this word in English is kind of doesn't exist, but it, it, I, don't, I haven't found mm -hmm. another one, yeah. but to provide a regular migratory status to undocumented Venezuelans. Um, and among other things we found, we found that there's no, there was no adverse uh, effects on the labor markets. We have a, also an interesting effect on, on female empowerment. Um, and this is work done with Sandra Rosa and Ana Maria Ibanez, who are two fabulous uh, mm -hmm. Colombian economists. And, 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 but we also have a, a, a recent study looking in particular about entrepreneurship. Um, and again, it's, it goes back to the idea of the match. It's, it's like may, maybe the match is not there, but the match yeah. uh, emerges. Yeah. And we found that, that, that individuals who, who receive a status, a, a, a mm -hmm. regular migratory status, they increase the, their rate of entrepreneurship by a factor of 10. Hmm. Let that sink in for a second. They increase their entrepreneurship rate. Once they have a visa that says you can stay here, you have access <coughs> to everything, they increase their entrepreneurship rate by a factor of 10. And this is only even formal entrepreneurship, like actually registering businesses mm -hmm. in the country. Of course, there's a whole fancy econometrics behind it, so we can discuss <laughs> about that in the, in, uh, afterwards. But, but I think that there's a lot of opportunities there right. in terms of the match, and of course, right. um, 
and all the way to that. Yeah. Well, and just to say that is such a high um, impact example of what Chalar was saying about how the match is endogenous to policy. Right. You know, you change the policy and you unleash the potential and increase the possibility of the match. So I think that's very exciting. Um, so Chalar, I do want to go to you next and um, you can respond to anything here. Then we will go to audience Q&A, so please prepare your questions. Um, so do you know, to comment on anything the panelists have said. And then I also did want to loop back to what you said about demographics and the care economy. This is also just a personal interest of mine. You mentioned your single parenting now. I think we all can, uh, many of us can share that experience and we also know whether in the US or in the economies you mentioned, you know, who will care for the aging population. So I am just curious for your further thoughts on that and, and also global skills partnerships. Please, CGD has a website on global skills partnerships. Please take a look. And where you see, you know, those, in terms of what you were saying, you know, we need complementary policies. How do you see that potentially coming together to address these demographic trends and then anything else you want to add so, so two things I mean when I joined the bank Danny mentioned I've been you know working with the migration conference and he was very kind me helping young colleagues so it makes me feel old uh, now I think about it when I first joined the bank 20 years ago orientation one of the VPs at the time said any development policy or any policy challenge can be reduced down to the tension the conflict between the short-term costs and the long-term gains. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Any policy challenge we face. And what the WDRs, in my view, is to basically highlight this yeah. and enable the policymakers, give them the tools and the insights and the wisdom, hopefully, to say, please ignore the short-term costs mm -hmm. and look at the long-term gains and yeah. do X, Y, and Z because that's what matters at the end of the day. Right? Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that's what we are achieving with the WDR, hmm. right? And we are saying, look at climate change, look at demography. Actually, the long term is no longer really the long term. Yeah. It's here. Mm -hmm. So we have now this kind of limited window to act, to get started, because things are going to change. We still have time to implement policies that benefit everyone. Now, uh, so that's the grand scheme of things. Let's step back. Let's not focus on day-to-day -day headlines in the media or the, especially the social media, I think makes it slightly more stressful for the policymakers. Mm -hmm. Let's step back and think in the, in the grand scheme of things. So that's, that's number one. Now, I wanna again emphasize the, the complementarity of the policies, that they have to be done as a package by everyone, not just each origin or destination country implements a package of policies that address their long-term needs, but they coordinate with each other. Right? That's what the, the WDR is saying. You do this, you do this as a package, but you do it also together as a, as a global community. Uh, origin, destination, global skill partnerships fall in that area. Taking care of the refugees fall into that area. So all of the examples we are given, you know, specific examples, fall into that category. I mean, that's what the WDR's objective is. Let's think things thoroughly. Uh, so the piecemeal and temporary migration yeah. uh, policies do not work. On the contrary, now, uh, in terms of other thing, uh, I mean, I, I'd love to hear the the questions rather than just you know tarting our own horns. This is what we're doing and all that stuff. But uh, people who are on the ground, who are facing real policy dilemmas, challenges, mm -hmm. and see how the WDR can yeah. guide them in their thinking, because at the end of the day, that's the objective of the WDR. Great, okay, then let's go to questions. First, let's start with the audience. Yes, we have, we have a microphone, please. Thank you. And we'll take two or three questions and uh, turn it to the, back to the panelists. Yes, please, I think here. Oh, in the back, yeah. Hi, I'm Ishani Kanpal, I'm a senior fellow at CGD. Um, before this, I was Chalar's colleague for also about 10 years. I guess we must have missed our 10-year anniversary. Um, <laughs> Thanks for this. This was fantastic, and you know, congratulations to you, Tuan, Sandra, and the, the team. The framework is is fantastic. It, you know, it, it's so clarifying, and it really um, presents uh, a wide set of issues in a really nice and intuitive way. Um, that said, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more, and when you present it, um, of the recognition of the work done by low and middle income countries. The fact that the largest refugee camps are in Kenya, in Sudan, in Bangladesh. Um, in Jordan, of course, and, and you know, Cindy talked a bit about uh, the bank's financing and, and the implicit recognition there, but the WDR is a unique opportunity to sort of shift the narrative away 
in a more constructive way, away from you know what Dr. Uh, Watson referred to as sort of the the political uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, dimension of that uh, conversation. And then you know you talked about the the um, brain drain uh, in your northwest quadrant, the economic migrants. But there's also, for example, a Barker and Theo Herides showing the brain gain that can occur. You know, for every Filipino nurse or Filipino nurse that emigrated to the US or UK, there were five or 10, I forget the exact number, uh, that, that came up in the Philippines as a result of the human capital investments there. Um, and, and that's really important uh, as part of the, uh, the development narrative, right? That's exactly what we want to see. Mm -hmm. So um, as your friend and colleague, if you don't mind the, the bluntness of this, I'd love to see you push back a little bit more. Um, thanks. Great. Thank you. I think we have another question up here. Hi, my name is Jason Wendell. I'm from the Global Development Incubator and also Labor Mobility Partnerships. And uh, my question is, you've, you've actually made a very compelling case for the development benefits of migration and, and how it's, it really is an opportunity. We've been analyzing the aid flows and philanthropic flows to enable mobility and things like that. And they're just, they're absolutely tiny relative to the size of the, of the need. So our estimate was about 0.5% of ODA is going to any kind of economic inclusion for people on the move, whether that's displaced or, or economic migrant. And it's a similar number for philanthropy. And I'm just wondering, why is it that because we know that there is a need for aid and philanthropy to make these things happen. There's language training, there's ethical recruitment, there's a whole amount of things that need to be invested in, especially on the sending side, but also on the destination mm -hmm. side. Why do you think so little uh, funding has come in, uh, given the size of the opportunity? And I would also note, you know, in addition to the 184 million, there's another 900 million people that say they would move across borders if they could. And yet it's just such, it seems like everyone says, oh, this is a niche, a niche issue. Great. Uh, okay. Let's. Okay. Maybe we'll just take one more, and then we'll turn it back to the panelists. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Yuko uh, from IOM. Uh, I've been uh, working on migration issues, um, Afghanistan, uh, Asia, mm -hmm. um, now in Latin America, Africa, and uh, Europe. Um, I have questions. Can I ask qu one question for each? Or just one. But maybe you can okay. pick one or two of them okay. so we have so, time to answer. <laughs> all right. Um, so um, perhaps to uh, Tara uh, for now, um, because you're, uh, you, you're, you have expertise on, my, uh, on migrant children. And I wanted to uh, seek your views on uh, uh, this re recent uh, New York Times uh, you know, article on the exploitation of um, mm -hmm. an unaccompanied migrant children, um, you know, exploited in uh, in many factories. Um, some of them are very, very well known. Um, what do you What do you see? What do you think that has to be has to happen? And along with the uh, your views on H two A and H two B. Uh, visas, it's, uh, it's a great opportunities for uh, migrants, uh, but what are the, what are the uh, you know, obstacles have to be removed to really uh, make it work? Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much. I think the fact that you have five questions is just a sign of what a rich conversation <laughs> this report is going to generate, you know, here and around the world. So maybe I will start with just the narrower questions here to Tara, and then I want everyone else to think about brain gain and pushing back against a brain drain narrative. And I love that study of, of nurses trained in the Philippines. And then also why so little investment has gone into this space. So everyone will think about that. So Tara, over to you. Um, Thanks for the questions. Um, I guess on the, the New York Times piece, um, for me it was not maybe as surprising as um, some of the discussion around it uh, made it out to be. Um, many of the, the kids who are here um, are here to work. That's, that's, they are economic migrants, and um, their family comes or they come alone with the intention of working. and. Um, I do think um, we need to address the, the conditions that they find themselves in. And in my, to my mind, the way to do that is going back to the legal status that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that um, there, are, there is a framework where people can stay, they have rights. And that's important um, for a variety of reasons. But one of them is that 
um, when people, kids or otherwise, come here without um, status, they are um, in positions where they really cannot advocate for themselves in the workforce. They're, they're here to work, they're, they're working hard, but they um, don't have any leverage with their employers because they have fear of deportation or other sanctions. Um, the same is true even with some temporary migrants, to get to your other question, mm -hmm. one concern I have about temporary migration programs, even though they are um, beneficial relative to uh, undocumented migration, they still put workers in a position where they can't advocate for themselves. So that's, um, that can lead to situations like the, the type we're talking about um, with the children. But also, um, I would say it's also bad for US-born workers because um, when there are um, adverse labor market effects for the US-born, it's workers who are most directly competing with the new migrants. And those are people who are also in situations where they don't have a lot of leverage with their employers often. And so um, it, when we give people rights and status, that gives, gives both the migrants more protection, but also benefits US workers because they are able to um, not be competing against people without um, the agency. Great, yeah, so ba um, back to the hopes for congressional action on that front. Um, okay, great, I'm just gonna go down the line. Uh, Danny, sure. on the other two um, questions. Great question. I think Jalar is going to have the hard time here, so but but I'm just going to maybe make it harder. Uh, no, I mean I, th I'm here for. I, I I think the next report of the World Bank on migration. I don't know when when are you going to be ready, Jalar? Hopefully uh, after I retire. Should, <laughs> should really be about this topic about 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 changing the the tone and the narrative about brain drain versus brain gain. Mm -hmm. um, or, or I mean, maybe not. It should, but I would I would recommend <laughs> to to tackle this because I think I think it's I think it really links together, right? And I think that that we also need to to change a narrative um, based on the facts, and and you know be, be, because I think the studies you mentioned you know are clear. There's another one in India too, by a friend of CGD, Gaurav Khanna, mm -hmm. uh, who was a postdoc here, showing that also the 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 the, 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 the possibility of actually going to the U.S as an engineer for a few years, um, increases the, the rate at which uh, mm -hmm. Indian citizens actually enroll in IIT, in the Indian uh, Institute of Technologies, and, and be, uh, create more engineers. So, uh, but, but beyond that, actually, there, there's so much more to be said about um, the idea of diasporas and how diasporas actually uh, mm -hmm. play a huge role, not only through remittances, but also through trade. Um, uh, um, FDI, um, the work of... Um, uh, Chris Parsons and, and Pierre Louis Vecina have shown that very clearly, and knowledge flows, and the idea that um, uh, you know migrants, uh, diasporas also like uh, go back to their or, uh, countries of, of destination, yeah. like uh, providing finance and and, mm -hmm. and and ideas and technologies. And I think that here, uh, you know, a mea culpa in, on, on behalf of all economists in the world is that for for decades, as opposed to any other topic, <laughs> for decades when we talk when we thought about migration, we only thought about labor markets. You know, the question was like, are there increasing salaries, are there lowering salaries, are there, you know, displacement, no displacement, and so on. But, but you, when you go to the trade literature, there's so many questions about it, right? Uh, trade and uh, trade and productivity and yeah. trade and R&D and <laughs> trade and investment. And, but when it comes to migration, for, for many decades, I, I think that we, we did, did really a disservice to ourselves by focusing on a very narrow topic, whether it's a much bigger issue, it's a more bigger driver of so many um, things, and, and, and I think this all goes into, into a brain drain. Last comment on the finance. Uh, I, I, I'm really interested in looking at your numbers, and, and I think that I would be even more not surprised, but I, I, I would really bet that if you also look at numbers of how much of this financing is going, not for humanitarian purposes, which are really important, like to help people when they come and so on, but for integration purposes, um, I, I would guess that the number is also going to be something like close below 1%. Um, and I think this is another thing that, that, that hopefully I think this report can, can, can make a big dent on, on thinking that a lot of the financing um, is really about um, the long-term gains and about integration, about helping firms in places that are lagging behind to get more, have more access to credit because the only way that migrants are going to be able to work is that if firms grow and firms will grow through credit. Um, but in many places where they, I mean, the, another chicken and egg, in many places where the migrants are, 
or the refugees in particular are coming are places that are lagging behind where firms don't have access to credit and so on. So this is all part, also a big part of the financing question that, that I just want to throw out there. Great. Okay. Felipe, why is the IDB not spending more on this topic? <laughs> no, no, no. Two, two, two very quick questions. About the, 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 the brain drain is, is absolutely clear, especially for the Caribbean, because they have a, a, a very big diaspora. They have a, a lot of their people in, in abroad. We are beginning to work, for example, with Jamaica government, trying to address how we can take more advantage of the diaspora, not only in terms of remittances, it's in terms of trade, in terms of returnees, in terms of how you create like a new era for the diaspora, and in the new era you can get more gains. Then I think this is a topic that we need to address further and deeper in the region, but especially with focus in the Caribbean, but or not talking about Venezuela, there are lost uh, 7.12 million people, especially the young people, then that, but I think this is a debate that we need to, to address <coughs> further. And just two comments about the, the money, about the money for these topics. I think that uh, uh, it is going to be like this. I, I don't think it's, it's going to be changed very quickly. Of course, there is some resources that's going with when, when the things are more dramatic, when the things are more critical for the humanitarian things. But for the development, I think you need to create that to show to the private sector that you can, can, uh, are going to, to have advantage in that. And in these, the bilateral uh, programs for created labor and circular and temporary migration is one of the ways that we can think that maybe the private sector is interested in investing this kind of uh, skills uh, gaps or this kind of things. And the other is, of course, the multilateral development banks. We need to play a role here in a different way. Because if you, as a donor, for example, get some resources to the bank, to the fund that we have, we can put, but we, we put these resources in a medium term loan for the government to really change the policy. It's not just for one short term, it's for the medium and long term benefit, not only for the migrants, but for the country. Then I think we need to thinking about not how to increase the, the humanitarian aid because it's, it's very complicated. I don't think there are much money there. How we can create another tool, financial tools, more linked to the development uh, institution and to the development um, uh, tools. Excellent. Okay, Chalar. Okay. Well, thank you for the questions. Uh, and I realize, you know, some of the questions, it's a big report and we try to cover all of this. So we discussed the brain drain issues and all that stuff. So let me quickly go through. Uh, on the children migrants, uh, it's a human tragedy. I think that our starting point is to accept that should not happen in a high-income country in the 21st century. It's simple as that, right? Forget about the economics of it. It's, it's just human tragedy. Right? Point. Mm -hmm. Full stop. But it, what it is also happening there in that distressed migrant category, mm -hmm. and it's the lack of complementary policies. The U.S. or it happens, it's not just the U.S., it happens in, in every country, right? In, in every destination country. Why aren't you enforcing proper labor right, labor laws? It has to be simultaneous. Every policy has to be designed and implemented and enforced at the same time. That's part of it. You cannot enforce one policy and not the other. Mm -hmm. As a result, when there is this huge demand for labor, you know, it's just like a power pressure. The pressure, it will find the smallest hole and it will push through and you get all these tragic outcomes. So approach uh, immigration policy from a bigger perspective and implement accordingly. Jason's question on this, I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna flip the question over. 184 million migrants, slightly two, over 2% two of the world population. Now you, you quoted 900 million people wanna move. I mean, talk is cheap, right? So we don't know what the actual number of people who wanna move, but it is way more than 184. The question is, if I were a CSO or any agency, I would spend my money on not how do I get people to move, how do I fight the policy restrictions that prevent mobility? Because the incentives of the people, incentives of the markets are going to take care of it. Mm. The vast majority of the 184 million people we're talking about have paid out of their own pocket to move because they know the gains are there. Why do I need to spend more money on it? Mm -hmm. Let's fight. What is blocking the, 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 the realization of the welfare gains? Right? Sorry, I've, I don't, if, so I'm not gonna you know, try to teach you your job, but that's what I would focus on. What is, what are the barriers? Now, uh, Ishani had two excellent questions. Uh, nobody answered the first one, low and middle income countries. Absolutely, right? 
what Colombia has done with the refugees, what, what Turkey has done with the refugees, we give those as examples. And I would like to think the European response to the Ukrainian crisis actually was partly and hopefully based on the lessons we learned from the previous crisis in terms of letting people move and giving them access to uh, education and healthcare policies and integrating them into the society. So reduce the burden on them and the, and the host community. Uh, there are many other countries which have done remarkably well. And uh, I mean, the report mentions those over and over, what are the uh, good examples. And there are a large number of high income countries which are not doing the right things. And uh, not the right things in terms of going against their own self interests. I'm not going to give names because I want to keep my job. Uh, but, you know, so low and middle income countries. But a lot of them are also realizing, I'm going to go back to, I'm going to try to tie everything back to our grid and to, you know, the big mm. shifts happening to demographic change. They see mm. what is happening. And they are, uh, the smart politicians are taking proactive policies. Now, brain drain and brain gain. So we, we have a whole section on it. There are, I mean, I have done a lot of work, so I don't want to, I want to talk about the WDR, not all the other work we are doing or uh, other things. But what the WDR is highlighting, multiple facts. Uh, development is about human capital at the end of the day. Right? And if there's a, sh and a lot of poor countries suffer from low human capital, no doubt. But I want to go back. Brain drain is not a problem, it's a symptom. Why are people leaving in the first place? So we have to implement policies that would attract or encourage or incentivize people to stay in the first place. If you take a slightly longer time horizon, look at what happened with Ireland and Italy and all that stuff. 100 years ago, they were main sending countries, maybe 120 years ago. Right? And now they're main receiving countries, and we're talking about Italy as you need migrants. That wasn't the case 120 years ago. Right? How many of the US population are descendants of the Italians or in Argentina, so on and so forth. Right? So things change and brain drain changes depending on the underlying economic conditions. Those are the single most important determinants of brain drain. It's the same thing with distressed migration. Right? What are the domestic conditions? Now, the other thing, we have to be very careful with the numbers, brain drain. Like a lot of the numbers from the Caribbean are exaggerated, partly because, I'm gonna start really fast. Yeah, yeah, we have okay. a, just a few more minutes, yeah. thank you. Because we have to look at the absolute numbers. A lot of the uh, Jamaicans, for example, in the United States are actually educated in the United States. They came as children, so we have to be very careful what we're talking about. And the Filipino nurses is the best example in that respect. Uh, it's not about where you, not only you meet the, the demands, but the demands, the needs, and the incentives of the destination country are aligned with the incentives of the origin country. That's where you get the policy action, and that's where you get the big off rates, right? People have to do things, governments, what is in their self-interest? They have to realize it, and they have to work together to do it. Nursing is a great example, but we have to do this on every other occupation we can yeah. think about. And then you solve not every problem, but a lot of the problems we can think about are naturally solved by themselves, because I'm gonna push back, we increase the match. Right? then everybody gains. Great. Well, this has been such a fantastic discussion. I will, we're out of time, so I'll just um, leave you with three points. I did want to go back to what Charla was saying about you know, big, hard public policy problems are often about how, when we look at short-term costs but long-term gains, what do we, you know, what can we do about that? So the second point is on the importance of, you know, how do we achieve better coordination and how do we overcome that problem? Institutions. Um, to help us coordinate. So we have an eye on World Bank evolution, what more can be done in this space. Also, thanks, we have a colleague here from LAMP, and I would just underscore, again, please go visit our website that, you know, the policies that lead to those mutual benefits and the program um, development of those can be really important. And I, I heard the Minister of Development of the UK, Andrew Mitchell, say recently, you know, when we develop training programs, we want to train two people in country and one person to leave, whether that's the right target or not. But like, let's think about what is smart policy design look like to unleash the potential when we remove barriers. And then the last thing I want to say is that the conversation across the humanitarian, refugee, you know, the legal community and economists 
in my view, has been transformational. Um, and it, just personally, my conversations with Xavier have really um, just helped, I think, break through a lot of my own thinking. So I just encourage everyone to continue that conversation, talk across communities, and therefore join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern time for the second part of this series. Thank you so much, and please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank and